Hey everyone, so this is to let you know that we're launching a new series and it's a bit of a new direction for Rebel Wisdom. In the aftermath of the films about the Dark Horse and the vaccine claims, we're really trying to leave behind all the kind of soap opera and that kind of detailed investigation and take it more into sense making, which is our main interest. Why I was interested in the Dark Horse in the first place was the difficulty of making sense, sense making outside the institutions. And it brings it back to the topic we've been covering for quite a while. And also it feels like with that Dark Horse piece, there was a kind of, for me at least, it really felt like a kind of um, a clear division between kind of what we've always been covering, which is a heterodox thought, contrarian thought. And it was kind of steering into criticism. I knew that it would get a reaction from some, for some people in the comments. And we've got a big overlap with the audience of the Dark Horse. So it's sort of steering quite deliberately into that. I'm not that interested personally in continuing to follow the vaccines and the ivermectin story. It's interesting and maybe people will be disappointed. Maybe we'll come back to it at some point in the future. Maybe we'll do a sort of regular pandemic update section. Um, but really we're a pretty small operation and we've got to think about what we cover and be very careful about what we cover. And also I really don't want for Rebel Wisdom to end up as like Snopes. Like fact checking is not something that is particularly of interest and people just then kind of, that becomes politicized. Snopes becomes politicized and people either trust it or don't based on their pre-existing views and that's just a really boring place to be. So that's not of interest. Um, really it's about sense making. So I think it's actually quite important that we define what we mean when we say sense making because we say it a lot and it's, it's something that's in, you know we feel is increasingly important and I think sense making is different to making truth statements or just understanding something and you know I think the process of us engaging with this concept um, has, has been a learning process for us and I think that's a really important thing. I'm really reluctant for, uh, to set ourselves up as kind of epistemic authorities on you know, the way we make sense is the way everyone should make sense. Um, sense making is about understanding in a kind of process what's going on and it's continuously changing. Um, and we're in a complex environment and so that complexity requires us to have a cognitive flexibility to be bringing in the whole person, to be connected to our emotional reality, to be connected to our cognition. Um, and that is an ongoing process of change. And we, that's literally us changing our minds as things develop. And what I've really noticed in the, this sort of heterodox idea space, and I think what I think, you know, we've actually been talking about this for quite a while, the danger has always been this, uh, you know, what John Verveke would call this kind of reciprocal narrowing, this narrowing of our frame of reference to a narrow, narrow point of certainty where eventually we're in a kind of reality tunnel where we can't get out of it. And so sense making for me, at least the way I understand it and the way I've, I've started to think about it, is a, is a process of really, um, again, as Viveki would argue, zooming out of our frames, seeing where our frames are broken and then zooming back in and using our frames. And you don't just do that once. That's a, that's a continuous ongoing practice. And so that process of staying curious, flexible, interested, engaged, that's, I think, what we're about. That's the interesting thing. It's not about finding a particular um, way of thinking and sticking to it or a particular narrative sticking to it. There is such a thing as truth. There is truth to find. Um, we're in a post-truth world, so that's more important than ever. But there's also a huge amount of complexity. So it's a kind of a fluid, fluid motion. That's what excites me right now. And it's what excites me about, I think, where we're headed. And so this film is the introduction to our new series, The State of Sense Making. And we're going to play a few clips from the films that we've got coming out. I think we've got about five films coming out in the next few days based around the sort of central topic of um, how do we make sense of the world? What do we need to pay attention to? What are the ethical questions that come up um, as sort of working in the alternative media space? We've got a great conversation with uh, Chris Williamson. Uh, we're actually re-releasing a couple of our films from the last couple of years that we think are particularly relevant now about collective intelligence and the science and psychology of polarization, which we're re-releasing as the science and psychology of difficult conversation, because it's kind of the same thing. And yeah, the, the, and basically we're also wanting to run a big event at the end of September with hopefully a few kind of big names and a few practices. And we're also going to call that, I think, the state of sense making coming up at the end of September. So have a look in the show notes below. You should be able to see how to register for that. But we're going to go into and also tell a little bit of the story of the channel, like how we've got to this point and 
because I think the story of where we've gone, the exploration that we've been on, kind of illustrates where we're at now and, yeah, explains kind of what we want to do next. So the story of the Rebel Wisdom Media Channel starts with Jordan Peterson in 2018 and our interest in him was really like this incredible cultural moment that erupted around him and kind of actually predicting that that would happen and pretty much putting all of our eggs in that basket and trying to understand the Peterson phenomenon. Uh, started with Truth in the Time of Chaos, which was the documentary about his thought, trying to explain his thought. And then shortly after that, Glitch in the Matrix, which is still, I think, the most popular film we've put out. Um, Jordan Peterson uploaded it to his channel, where it's still, I think, the third most popular film he's ever put out. Got over five million views. And that was really trying to understand this kind of insurgency against the liberal mainstream that Jordan Peterson represented and was also kind of present with Trump and present with Brexit. It's like, what is going on? And Jordan Peterson, also at the center of Jordan Peterson's philosophy, I think that really kind of um, we resonated with was this idea of the redemptive power of truth. The truth is something that burns. It burns off dead wood. And people don't like having their dead wood burnt off often because they're like 95% dead wood. And, and I'm not being, I'm, believe me, I'm not being snide about that. It's no joke when you start to realize how much of what you've constructed of yourself is based on deception and, and lies. That is a horrifying realization. And there were real echoes of that Jordan Peterson, that whole Jordan Peterson kind of philosophy and worldview with Aisha Akambi at our event recently at Wilderness. When I think about spirituality, I just see it as the removal of that which is false fundamentally, you know, is the attempt to remove that which is false in ourselves, in our external worlds, in our relationships, in our families. So I think, think some really important context about what was going on when we started up was, of course, Brexit and then Trump. So there was this kind of insurgency against the, um, the liberal worldview, which was a really fascinating thing to watch. And like we had already been running uh, kind of transformational workshops and, and training as counselors um, and kind of deeply involved in inner growth work. I think what was really interesting um, and a little bit polarizing, and certainly in our groups of friends, was that the shadows of liberalism were being challenged and were being surfaced. And so much of the anger at the kind of established order that was expressing itself through Brexit and Trump could be I think could be seen through a lens of shadows that hadn't been named in the culture and a big um, reaction against those shadows. And so, you know, I remember at the time trying to have those conversations in, in our groups of friends who, you know, quite progressive groups um, and getting a lot of pushback. And now, maybe two or three late, two or three years later, a lot more recognition of, oh, okay, there are a lot of shadows in the progressive spaces. There are a lot of shadows, certainly in the spiritual communities. We've seen that through COVID. We've seen it with you know, yoga teachers becoming QAnon supporters. We've seen it with a real rise of, um, or like a decline of sense making in a lot of communities. And now there's a growing recognition of, okay, yeah, there does need to be a reckoning and a clearing of house in, in I suppose, what used to be called progressive politics, progressive culture. Um, and, and that was really, and it really did come down to kind of the shadow, I think, that this understanding of those aspects that are unexpressed and what is the process that we need to go on individually, but also as a culture to acknowledge, name, and then integrate those into society. I don't know whether that's happened yet. I don't think we're like finished that process, but I think it's really uh, an important framing to hold. Yeah, and I think you could probably distill it down to what fueled Brexit and Trump was this sense of a tribalism that wouldn't acknowledge that it was a tribalism. This sort of the, the, the liberal progressive worldview that was like, um, we're so open to everything, we're so open to everyone from all around the world, from different sexualities, apart from those people who don't think like us. And this was fundamentally what fueled like this kind of complete um, separation of society that I think Brexit and Trump really exposed and they basically said more than anything, stop, yeah, stop, because you've basically split society. I think David Goodhart's view of somewheres versus anywheres was really useful, like anywheres being people with achieved identities who could live anywhere, um, they're kind of university educated, they could live in any of the major cities, 
and that they had completely divorced from people with a sense of rootedness, with a sense of kind of moral grounding connected to their place, connected to their communities, and they just no longer understood each other because these worlds had just got completely split. Um, the interesting thing about Jordan Peterson is that Jordan Peterson, I think, articulated a lot of the, the, the truths that were not fully articulated or denied by this kind of progressive low resolution grand narrative about the world, things to do with kind of gender differences and um, the, the need for traditional values and like not disposing of traditional values. And the fascinating thing about that was that Jordan Peterson, as a, as a friend of, of ours, um, uh, who runs the Emerge podcast, um, Daniel Thorson, uh, talked about he broke a conversational seal, which I thought was a beautiful way of explaining that. Like at the beginning of 2018, he was saying these things in public. He was going on media channels and saying these things and what this incredible kind of arc of the, the Jordan Peterson story. I think he, he had a partial truth. I don't think he had a, a whole truth as I've seen recently and we've sort of covered on the film that I put out with Jonathan Rowson, but it was a necessary partial truth. And he broke that conversational seal, but that conversational seal was broken. Like, I think because we've still got a lot of audience who found us through Jordan Peterson and through the coverage of the intellectual dark web, I don't think they quite realize it's like, we're not in 2018 anymore. That's why our content has changed because we're now at a place we've had consensus, we've had antithesis, and now we're looking for synthesis. And I think we're looking for synthesis in the wider culture. Like you said, when we were putting out our films in 2018, we had quite a lot of our friends kind of being like, oh, are you sure about this? Like, what are you kind of, yeah, kind of like, oh, I'm not sure about this kind of questioning of sort of Me Too or questioning of all of these sort of what, what we understand about what's going on. But over time, pretty much everyone has had some attempt at being canceled or they've seen their friends get canceled or they've seen how this kind of intersectional kind of woke worldview can be weaponized very easily and have been like, oh, oh, we get it. We get it now. Like this is this has happened. This is happening. And so that's why our content has changed. And that's why we think that what's required now is a different kind of synthesis. It's not we're not. And, I, and we've seen so many people get stuck in that antithesis. The entire intellectual dark web thing got stuck in that antithesis. And if you get stuck in that antithesis, it's you don't have a that's why I think so many of the figures within it have declined in their credibility, have declined in their kind of influence because they got stuck in that kind of certainty, in that kind of lack of evolution. And I think that's a catastrophic place to be. And I'd, I'd even include Jordan Peterson in that. Like, I think he got stuck in his story. He kept telling the same story, even though it's one of the greatest stories ever told. And I think it's an incredible story, like the deep story of Western culture. And I think he, because he was saying it time and time again, he, he kind of like, you, that's not sustainable. It's not it, even the greatest story in the world can't sustain you if you're not generating novelty, if you're not kind of having those experiences that, and I think he was like the last gasp of the heroic individual and articulated the story of the individual probably as well as anyone ever has. But it's and it was necessary, but not sufficient. Mm. And so that insufficiency, I think, is is why the Peterson phenomenon kind of the wave broke and then sort of crashed. Um, and and we sort of followed that. We followed into the intellectual dark web. We followed into kind of collective intelligence, into all these different areas that we'll cover in a second with some other clips. Yeah, and I think what what that reminds me of is um, there's always been this. Um, creative tension, I think, in what we're doing between going meta and so really zooming out and looking at what's happening in the, in the complex system and trying to understand uh, what's going on and then zooming into the particulars like, let's say, the excesses of, of intersectionality or the excesses of any kind of tribe in the culture wars. And I think that that's, that's an interesting tension because if you stay meta, you, you just end up kind of avoiding the specifics and you, you don't actually engage with culture. You don't actually get your hands dirty and dive in and, and have the difficult conversations, ask the difficult questions. But like you were saying a second ago, if you locate the problem in the symptom and you just stay there, you start your frame. That, that I think is the narrowing of the frame. And so I think what's, what's helped a lot is speaking to people you know, like Daniel Schmachtenberger, uh, like John Verveke, um, who, who have that wider kind of frame looking at the entire system 
and that links to this this tension between the individual and and the collective. You know, there's almost a kind of a um, you know, there have been times where we've mentioned the word collective and people have balked at it. You know, it's like, oh, collectivism. Oh, no, that's this kind of um, a Ayn Randian fear of collectivism. And I, I, you know, I have some sympathy for that. I think the individual and um, a focus on the individual is vitally important. But it's a yes and, because as we've seen talking to people who look at the whole system and have an understanding of that, I think much better than either of us. I don't think we're necessarily systems thinkers. I feel very much that I'm learning about systems all the time. But it becomes strikingly obvious that you cannot just focus on the individual. We are all absolutely interconnected. And the level of complexity, as, as Schmachtenberger talks about, is way too much for one individual person to, to solve. So we have to simultaneously be individual and be engaging with the collective. That's why we've talked about the, the concept of sovereignty so often, because that implies that we're connected to ourselves, but we're also open and receptive to, to our environment and being changed by one another, too. Yeah, and just to go back to, like, just to, this is sort of a recap of the journey that we've been on, and also, in particular, the, the intellectual dark web that we covered the emergence of because it was a fascinating alternative sense-making network. For the first time, it was like, oh, maybe the internet might generate some of the solutions as well as the problems, like the problems of, of, that we are obvious of the way that um, the the media has been kind of swallowed up by these big tech companies, there's the censorship, there's all these different kind of angles. And also like not to minimize, it's still the case that the media in particular is still captured by a very narrow kind of progressivism. Like we covered that very much last year, kind of the, the, the woke revolt inside the newsrooms that led to kind of the departure of Barry Weiss and led to um, a lot of the, the American media kind of in the aftermath of Black Lives Matter, a lot of it folding. We covered that in the, the State of Sense, and I know what the fuck is going on, uh, the Sense Making series last summer. Um, and that was the case last summer. It's still the case that a lot of the media are captured by this kind of very narrow worldview, but I think they're becoming less and less relevant. And also, people have their own substacks. You're seeing like Barry Weiss has become, her, her substack is becoming really popular. Like, it's not simply the case that. If you're only looking at the mainstream and saying, oh, it's just captured by wokeism, it's like, yeah, but the mainstream is kind of declining in influence very, very quickly as well. And it's not the case that that's the entire media ecosystem. There's very strong, there's very strong anti-narrative, anti-consensus forces on the other side, which is what the whole point of the Dark Horse series was. Be careful. Like, okay, you look at the corrupting factors and the, the problems with the mainstream, but if you can get captured by the alternative narrative very, very easily and just say, oh, well, the mainstream's corrupt, so we're just going to follow. And, and often the people who are kind of pushing the alternative narratives, that's based on absolutely nothing. Like, it's based on things taken out of context, it's based on misinformation, it's based on, yeah, it's, it's, so it's very clear that we've got to be careful on both sides. Like, don't collapse either side. Keep aware of the corrupting facts of the mainstream, which is what Eric Weinstein talked about really well in the Glitch in the Matrix film, Glitch in the Matrix 2, about the origins of the intellectual dark web, and I think that was, again, a piece of its time. I think what's going on with a consensus is that a consensus is usually achieved through some sort of incentivizing people, as the, uh, as the mobs, uh, the violent mobs in Mexico say, plato o plomo, do you want silver or do you want lead? So you're given a certain amount of encouragement to come to a particular perspective, maybe in terms of grant money or speaking opportunities, and you're given a disincentive, which is this is what's going to happen to your career if you don't fall in line. Yeah, and just thinking back, like during that time, I think when the intellectual dark web was really at its heyday, I mean, it was really exciting because people were having, you know, I think, I think it was Eric Weinstein you used to use the phrase a lot, thinking in public. That was very exciting. That is really important. But at the same time, you know, while it was going on, I think we, we had a real sense that there is something missing, something crucial missing, which was um, an understanding of psychology, an understanding of our emotional landscape, understanding of concepts like the shadow, an understanding of how that completely changes our cognition. Um, and so we, we started talking about the need for an intellectual deep web, by which we meant some, something that would bring together all of those elements at the same time as talking about ideas, because I think they all need to happen at the same time. And we experimented an awful lot with that. Um, and part of that happens in person through events. What, what was really interesting was that the events of the intellectual dark web, which were mainly run by uh, Travis Pangburn at the time, 
they were these, um, it, was, it was fascinating because it was almost like intellectual rock stars. So there's a huge, almost like arena shows of, you know, you know, uh, Peterson and, and Sam Harris debating and, and, you know, and, and, you know, other members of the intellectual dark web. And there was a, it, it was still a broadcast modality though, right? This is interesting. So it was still a, a process of, we as the audience sit and watch something happening. And, uh, you know, we always had a sense as well that this, this new kind of paradigm of making sense is going to require some elements of broadcast, but a lot of collective sense making, uh, which we actually saw with, with De something decentralized. decentralized, exactly, decentralized collective intelligence. So and we saw some, a really nice example of that with the lab leak. You know, we saw the, the, the group, what was the group called drastic. again? Yeah, Drastic, who, who, and I think that's a lovely example of that. Really, really solid, uh, grounded research to uncover something that the mainstream had said wasn't true. And then through, through good kind of investigative work, they're completely changing the mainstream narrative. And I think that's a really good example of it. And so the, the Pangburn events kind of imploded. And one of the ones that imploded um, a group of people who couldn't go to the actual event decided, hey, let's all just kind of meet, talk, have a chat. And they ended up, you know, creating that for themselves. And I think that was a real moment as well where, where I was thinking, yeah, there, that is what's special. And that's where the energy is, is, it, is in us making sense together in a particular way with particular techniques um, and approaches. And, you know, we we had our own experiment with that, with the, the Rebel Wisdom Summit a couple of years ago, where we were trying to see what it looks like to actually talk about difficult, challenging cultural ideas and bring in some of the tools we know about from, from inner growth work, um, from our training, and see, see how they combine. Um, and I think it, it, it worked. It wasn't perfect. It was an experiment. And I think I, I genuinely feel, you know, this is something I think about all the time is, how do we get closer and closer to that, that combination that really works, where we can have impossible conversations that tap into the taboo, the taboo, bring in a new element of ourselves where we can actually change our, each other's minds and change our own minds. And we're in that curious, flowing kind of space. And I think that's an ongoing experiment. I don't think we've cracked that yet, but I think we're, we're closer than we've ever been, let's say. Yeah, and just to pick up on the bit about the intellectual dark web, I think it was missing a few things. I think it was missing um, I think the Pangburn trajectory really affected it because it, it, it was a kind of implosion. And the, the New York event was when they had the meetup in New York. That, and I think came out of, what came out of that was Ryan Bennett, who was there and was one of the sort of principal organizers of it, came up with the IDW protocol, the idea of the IDW protocol, which was if you pursue truth, um, truth instead of being right, then you're in the IDW. If you um, favor... Yeah, I can't, I'll bring it up on screen. I can't remember all, the, all of the ones. But effectively, it was kind of like, could we see it as a network? Could we see it as a more like a protocol for the internet than a set of people? Because um, whenever, it, I mean, it, was, it, it died as soon as it was named. I mean, ultimately, it died as soon as it was named because the paradox of the entire thing was these people aren't dark. They've only been dark to one. And, and Eric said that. Eric's like, well, they've only been dark to one thing. It's the, the mainstream. It's like, yeah, for sure. But as soon as you say, like, Joe Rogan, Sam Harris, Dave Rubin are a dark, it's like, this is one of the most popular podcasts in the world. This is one of the most influential podcasts in the world. It's like, obviously, it's not dark. So it was going to create the reaction that it did and the, the kind of immune reaction I think they talked about from the, from the mainstream. Um, but there was that paradox. Like, it was paradoxical once it had been named. And I think my sense is that Eric Weinstein saw it more as a kind of team or that he'd created a team. And I think he'd actually created a meme. And I don't think like it was it was never going to work that that many people with different ideas, different kind of incentive structures, different reasons to to have. Yeah, that they could ever align in any meaningful way. And so I think the splits that we then saw and the fallouts that we then saw and Sam Harris turning in his membership card and like that sort of being kind of the, probably the last nail in the coffin of it as a kind of going concern was all linked to that um, origin. But the other thing I think it was missing, I think Peterson brought this, but I don't think anyone else in there did, was this sense of the sacred and this sense of the real problem. Like I think it had a secular bias, sort of quite a sort of rationalist secular bias um, in most of the other members, Peterson 
located the problem in the right sphere. He located it as a theological problem. Like it's, it's actually a problem that's based in sort of the kinds of people that we are. And ultimately that we can't change that without changing the kinds of people that we are. And I think Sam Harris realized that to some degree because he's putting a lot of energy into his waking up app. And so he is kind of delving into, okay, we need to, to mainstream kind of practices around presence, practices around kind of inner growth. And I think he, he's certainly kind of leaning into that area more than many of the others were. But Peterson, the paradox for me of Peterson was that he focused so clearly on the individual, named so many of the problems, like the problem of evil, the problem of kind of like that we wrestle with as individuals, but then didn't ever expand it to, and if that is the nature, and also threat, kind of criticized the new atheists for having a very narrow conception of human nature. And it's like, yeah, but if you're in a world that is run by that very narrow conception of human nature, like the new atheists and a very sort of narrow definition of like Darwinism and all of the fuel for that, what kind of world are you living in? Like what kind of systems will we build if we're trying to measure everything like st statistically, but, we, but we've lost sight of the value of everything. And like that's where I think the, the pity was because I think if he'd gone a little bit further, he would potentially have had a message that would have been appealing to a lot more people because then you start to get into like the problem is not capitalism. That's the kind of the problem of the left is that they, they stop at the, at the wrong level as well. It's like it's the exploit because good capitalism exists. The free market is a, is a wonderful invention and allows kind of for good ideas to thrive and the bad ideas to be whittled away just by the sort of signaling system of the market. So it's not capitalism. It's a specific type of exploitative behavior that is enabled through our economic system. And it's based on the idea that there is nothing more, like there is no reason to be a good person because we're going to die. That's the end of the. That's the end of it. And so you might as well hoard everything that you can. So it's kind of based in a in a kind of theological misunderstanding about who we are and what we are, which kind of brings us to the psychedelics in a way because that can open us up and give us an expanded sense of who we are beyond just the kind of narrow materialist. Um, but let's move on a little bit to Ken Wilber because. Ken Wilber, we, that was sort of, if, we, if we're tracking like the influential films that we put out, the influential um, conversations we've had, I think that was a really key one because Ken Wilber was such, and he brought together that kind of trying to integrate the world of spirituality with the worlds of kind of culture and science and the entire, all of work, the world's knowledge under one system in the early, uh, kind of late 90s, early 2000s. And so the, the Ken Wilber, and I still, I think we both would say that Ken Wilber still has one of the best maps to understand what's going on. See, stages apply to an enormous number of different skills, and so you can have dozens of different names for these stages, and it can get confusing. So one of the things we do is just give them, give them colors. So the previous ethnocentric stage we call amber, and then this orange, rational, world-centric, universal care stage we call orange. Those two stages, amber, ethnocentric, conventional, traditional, and then this new orange, universal, universal rights, these started to arise again during the Western Enlightenment. With the 60s, that new stage of world-centric development tended to emerge, and that's what we call green, or it was multicultural. So it wasn't just an, an, uh, a belief in individuality and its freedom. There's a lot of different opinions about postmodernism on the intellectual uh, dark web. In general, nobody likes it. Um, my point, some things we can talk about, is that a lot of it really is off the wall, extreme, bad, however you, you want to think about it. But that it also had a core of some true, if very partial, notions. Um, and those truths were initially what actually helped to drive that stage of development. And it did start to call itself postmodern because it was reflecting on the previous modern stage of orange, liberal, rational, universal care, individual, liberty, freedom, freedom of speech, 
it reflected on all of those intended to have sort of a, a critique of those. But it's still having trouble finding ways to actually integrate them. And so it tends to take a stance that believes in radical egalitarianism. And so its version of equality is unlike the previous orange version of equality. Orange's version is liberty and freedom of opportunity. For green and its egalitarianism, it wants equal outcome. And this becomes enormously conflictual. Integral was really influential on, on both of us. You know, so I, I think I read Integral Spirituality when I was um, in university, and it was quite, quite life-changing in the sense of, oh, wow, you, you can look at uh, transcendence and spirituality and be able to kind of map it. It's, it's kind of nerdy, actually. Um, and Jamie, Jamie Wheel, um, who we, you know, is a, a good friend of ours and we've had on the channel quite a few times, he, he, I think, said it really well, is that, I mean, well, part of the reason it failed is because too many people mistook the map for the territory. So you can have this big model of reality, which, which contains so many of the different aspects of reality, but that's not reality. That's, that's just a guide. And I think this is true of many things, not just integral. And so then I think he, he called it kind of eggheads masquerading as Jedi. There is a ironically kind of something missing around the, the actual lived feeling of transcendence, the lived feeling of spirituality, which uh, not, not in all integral communities, but certainly I think um, was a big part of it. And actually we have a clip of, of Jamie talking about this. The map not being the territory was just one of the grandest ironies of the integral movement because it was parroted all the time by the people who are 100% obsessed with the map and not getting outside and roaming around. And so that was another thing is it felt like there was a, a very strong bifurcation of the people who were drawn to the integral movement. And on the one hand, much smaller number, but essential to the life of the movement, were people who were actually arguably already awake or realized themselves in the sense that they were living in the territory. And, and then there were all the sort of late majority of the people who were drawn by the contact high of Ken's writings and the methodology itself. And because of Ken's broad sweep, because of his synthetic analysis of a lot of disciplines, all of those, and, and because of the sort of confidence bordering on hubris with which he held forth and proclaimed the nature of things, if somebody hadn't done their own primary research and wasn't deeply versed in the disciplines that he was presuming to speak of, they took his, his synthesis and analysis as gospel and never went back and did the hard work of reading the original sources and drawing their own opinions or triangulating between other experts and leaders in those given disciplines. But it's interesting because a lot of our audience are what, what we call kind of integral refugees, by which we mean, you know, integral was a huge force in let's say the early 2000s. And it was, you know, Al Gore was into it, Alanis Morissette. It was, um, it was a really significant cultural philosophical force and then, and then declined. So a lot of really engaged, very intelligent people who were interested in these ideas who, who didn't, you know, have platforms to explore. And I think a lot of them ended up being interested in rebel wisdom, which is, which is fantastic. I think it's added a huge amount. Um, but I think we've, we've always been careful and, and conscious of, of not being sort of like an integral endeavor in the sense of, I think we're really integrally informed, but Jamie Wheel said it really well. It's a really great model to learn and then forget. Because again, the, the risk is falling into getting too far into the, the, the map rather than the, uh, the territory. What I think is really useful about Integral and why I still think it's worth people checking out and engaging with is that a, a, lot, of what, a lot of what I've noticed is that the, the being able to tolerate complexity is an absolutely core skill right now. Because we're in a very complex environment with a lot of pressures on our attention, many of which are going to lead us down rabbit holes, which are into complete f falsehood and, and bullshit, basically. Being able to hold multiple perspectives at once without collapsing our entire worldview into any single one of them is it's not a nice to have anymore. It's, it's essential. We can't really function very well without it. And integral as a, as a kind of way of approaching the world and a way of splitting different types of um, approaching knowledge and understanding and um, sensation is really, really useful. And it builds, I think, our complexity tolerance, which is, is something we've covered on the channel, as does 
meditation, as does inquiry, as do a lot of the practices that we found really, really useful and that you know, we include in Sense Making 101, for example. So yeah, all the way through, we've really been looking for like, where is the next generation? Like who are the new and interesting voices that are holding a really key part of the picture? Like assuming that as we showed and talked about in the collective intelligence film that we're releasing, re-releasing now, um, it's impossible for any one mind to hold all of the answers. And those that try fail, flame out quite spectacularly. Anyone who kind of tries to, to kind of think that they've got the whole model themselves, like their map is complete, it's, it's a recipe for disaster, as we've seen kind of quite clearly publicly. Um, so it's trying to find like who are holding the different pieces, how can we possibly get them in dialogue with each other? And so one of the, the really interesting people that we um, found a couple of years ago is John Bavaki, who is also, uh, ironically, was a colleague of Jordan Peterson's at the University of Toronto, doing similar work in a way. He, had, he brought out his Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series in the aftermath of Jordan Peterson, um, I think to kind of contribute, kind of follow Peterson's path in a little, in a way. Um, but what's different about him is this emphasis on practice. Like it's very much, he talks about Buddhism and cognitive science. He's got this beautiful model that maybe you can talk about in a second about kind of the 4E cognitive science, which replaces Descartes' system. Like it, it says, he basically says, look, Descartian kind of the Descartian split is gone in four cognitive science. We're in a different world, but we haven't adapted to that. Like we're still living in ideas that have been proved to be wrong and are dead and should have been buried a long time ago. Um, but the interesting thing, and I think John sort of jokingly says Jordan Peterson was a doorway, but not a way. And that often Jordan Peterson would be a kind of um, gateway drug to his work. I think he said it in a very sort of self-effacing way, like he, he really, really values Jordan Peterson's work and thinks he's an incredible public speaker and great performer, obviously. Some of the important uh, similarities, uh, uh, I think you put your finger on it very well. I think we're both concerned with the issue of meaning and the meaning crisis. Um, I, would, uh, I would claim, in fact, that I think a significant proportion of Jordan's popularity is that he's talking about uh, the meaning crisis, because I think it's exigent right now and perhaps even urgent. Um, and uh, we are interested in uh, the role of myth and ritual. Uh, Jordan is also, I believe, interested in altered states of consciousness. Um, so those are some of the significant uh, similarities, I would say. Uh, and so we've, we've shared a lot of students over the past years because of this. Uh, we've spoken at multiple conferences together because of, of these shared interests. Um, Jordan also has an interest, because uh, I had a public debate with him a quite a while ago on what's called the frame problem, which relates to the work I do on relevance realization. So that, there's a shared interest there. Some of the main differences. Um, so Jordan's framework is very largely uh, from psychology personality theory and um, from psychodynamic background, Jungian. Um, so I, I know Jung, and I've gone, I've, I went through Jungian therapy to get an inside understanding of it. I've taken workshops, um, and, and I, I, I do some relevant work around that. So I have some understanding of it. I don't have his expertise, um, but that, that is not the primary framework within which I work. The framework with, with, within which I work is very much a cognitive science framework. Something that's really useful about John Brubeke's work is, I mentioned it a little bit before, but an understanding of how we frame reality and how these practices actually help us not fall into what, what John often calls foolishness, you know? These cognitive traps, these cognitive biases that we're all prone to just because of the nature of, of how we see and think. The practices aren't just this kind of abstract spiritual thing that's like a well-being thing to make you feel a little bit better or whatever it might be, it's just often seen like that in the culture, they are essential tools to stay cognitively flexible and fluid. And a lot of the research and a lot of the psychedelic research coming out, like we, we had Robin Carhart Harris um, with us at, at Wilderness Festival, which we just released recently. You know, he, his research, it's fascinating. It starts linking very closely. And I know John uses his research a lot as well. We're seeing that so much of mental illness is, is also linked to this narrowing of focus and this narrowing of possibility and, and not being able to like think fluidly where we get more and more trapped. 
And so practices like mindfulness, like Tai Chi, like um, certain psychedelic practices, certain movement practices, allow us to step back from our frame of reference. And we need that more than ever. Um, you know, Verveke also has um, four different, he talks about four different types of knowledge. Very often the knowing of science is propositional knowing, which is important. And propositional knowing is knowing that. And the way we train our propositional knowing is by taking a truth statement and um, testing it against reality and, and seeing, seeing if it's true. And that's, that's very important. And that's kind of what I see as kind of an intellectual debate, you know, but it's limited as well, because there's also, and I always forget the four <laughs> different ways of knowing. I have written a, a whole essay, which, which includes this, which we can put in the, in the show notes, kind of lays it out a little bit more succinctly, but there's also procedural knowing, which is like knowing how to ride a bike, completely different way of understanding the world, equally valid for making sense and being a human being who's alive. There's participatory knowing, being sort of like deeply immersed and, and at one with the world. And this links also to another thing which I think is important about meaning and connection, which is something we've really noticed as, as a kind of a, a core concept. Um, and then there's also perspectival knowing, like knowing what it's like to, to be drunk, for example. But just on, on the, um, the participatory knowledge is the one that is actually at the, at the kind of top or bottom of the stack, whichever way you see it. That's that sense of being in, in deep flow with the world. And I say, you know, one of the core things about John Verveke's work is, is, you know, his theory is called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. So this, that's a concept that I think has been absolutely crucial for, for us, this, this sense of that our culture is in a crisis of, almost an existential crisis of, of meaning. We don't know why we're here. We don't know what we're doing. We're not connected to something solid, whether that's a, a, you know, the land or you know, it used to be a national identity or religion. We have this void. And a lot of the culture wars, I think, are an expression of us trying to fill that void, trying to kind of have a religious connection to our identity. So we see it in identity politics. It's almost like a desperate questing to be different or special. We see it also in um, this, this desperate need to be part of a political tribe. So we're replacing, and this is not a new idea, you know, many sociologists have talked about this, we're replacing religion with, with politics and with identity and with ideology. And that is a massive issue. That is a huge issue and we're seeing it playing out absolutely everywhere. So I think that that framing is, has been crucial. So certainly over the last couple of years, we've sort of been narrowing closer and closer into the question of sense making, like this sense that that's right at the core, that unless we can, the problem of truth, the problem of tr finding truth together, the, find tr tr the problem of agreeing on what's true and how we're being, particularly in an environment where we're being manipulated limbic hijacked by the tech platforms that are forcing us into ever smaller and smaller echo chambers, forcing us into an environment where it just reinforces all our existing biases because that's what we want. Like that's, so we, we've, we're up against these incredibly sophisticated tools that are pushing us into um, effectively using our weaknesses against us, our cognitive weaknesses against us, mining our attention. And so this process of like, okay, we need, like this is an unfair fight. And so that's why practice is necessary. That's why kind of being aware of what we're doing and what we're bringing to it is becoming necessary. And so this, a lot of this really started with the like runaway success of the film that we put out with Daniel Schmachtenberger, which was called The War on Sensemaking. I've never actually shared publicly these types of frameworks before. So this feels fun and exciting and uh, I, I hope that it's useful. As I've been trying to uh, make sense of the world, making sense of why sense making is so hard is pretty central. As a, a famous quote, I think attributed to Einstein, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. As simple as possible, really the goal is, is as clear as possible, right? But simpler would mean it's wrong. Like it's not accurate anymore. If I'm, you know, you're gonna have to face this doing media work, there will be pressures on you to say, hey, 
people can't pay attention to more than sound bites. You gotta make it five minute chunks. The, the word size is too big. Make it for an eighth grade level, right? Which is saying, people are dumb, so spoon feed them stuff that dumb people can handle. Which, to the degree you do that and it's successful, will keep people dumb. But that's what, that's what like those are the pressures in, in anyone doing broadcast, even for a hopefully good intention, right? And if we want people to actually be able to make sense of the world well, you can't do it in very short periods of time with lots of distraction and oversimplified. Like if you, if you look at anyone who actually increased the sense-making capacity of the world, you look at any scientist or philosopher, they didn't do it in tweets and they didn't do it radically distracted and they didn't do it in a dumbed down process. And I, I recently found out that Daniel wasn't so happy with the name, The War on Sensemaking. Um, and I understand why, because that suggests that there is a something warring on sensemaking. And probably a better title for it would have been The War of Sensemaking. Because it's actually like that, it's sort of an almost like a conspiratorial framing to say, well, obviously there are some actors doing it, but it, it's not like there's a group of people that are deliberately trying to warp sense making for everybody. It's more that these tools exist, they're decentralized, they're being used by everyone to, to kind of like, everyone has agency, everyone is trying to act in, in, in whatever ways they can. Um, so yeah, maybe we can re, rename it the war of sense making rather than the war on sense making. We put out a whole series of films with Daniel Schmachtenberger, other amazing thinkers like Jordan Hall and Jamie Wheel. And then that particularly fascinating piece that we put out called Making Sense of Sense Making. Coherence is this ephemeral emergent property, best never named, never subject to right. reality capture, reality tunnel capture, like yes. it's that thing. Then how the hell do you scale it? Because we're storytelling monkeys. And at some point we need recipes to help the thing propagate. So this goes Unless back to everybody's the question just of Yoda Zen. Why does it always break down? Mm -hmm. why, do, why every time we try to scale does it break down? One of the reasons is because, as our friend Lao Tzu discovered, and by the way, also our friend Buddha discovered, and our friend Jesus discovered, every time the storytelling monkeys try to turn into a story to tell, they fuck it up. So, yeah. let's be mindful of that, and recognize that the storytelling piece of it definitely isn't the answer. The whole concept of sense making and, and Daniel's work and, and many of the, the brilliant people we've, we've talked about already um, were an inspiration for our online course, which we launched actually right at the beginning of, uh, it was in March 2020. So it, it was coincidentally, we'd already kind of uh, put it up and it had already um, filled up and it started right when lockdown started. So there was a real uh, incredible energy around it. And also we started becoming really interested in this, this concept of sense making um, and, and what it actually takes to figure out what's going on. Um, and a lot of what we've talked about already, a lot of the practices, a lot of the different models we've talked about, just felt really like really useful tools, things we found useful. So we created Sense Making 101, our, our online course, which has now been running for about um, uh, 18 months. You know, we're in kind of the, the fifth cohort of it. And, and it's really based on, on something that we have believed since before we had the media channel, which is that we have to live these ideas into our lives. We can't just watch our way to changing our minds or watch our way to, to, to growing and, and expanding ourselves in the way we think. It, it has to, it's an embodied process that we actually have to practice, and not just alone, but with other people. You know, it's, it's not just an individual process. It's a process of really coming into um, learning more about ourselves, get, get, gaining the skills like mindfulness, like decentering, being able to take a step back from the content of our experience, getting different models, and then applying those to making sense of what's around us and making sense with each other. So yeah, then we had the, the pandemic and the, the next big thing, I think, the next big series of films that we put out was about London Real. And that was because the free speech argument was being weaponized in such a cynical way. That was a real kind of case study of how, yeah, these ideas, like sacred ideas of free speech, um, could be weaponized by sociopathic people to get rich. Like he made a million dollars out of a very cynical, deliberate attempt to kind of cry censorship and cry free speech um, in the aftermath of his David Icke interview. Um, 
and also what was fascinating as well was it kind of reconnected me a little bit to my journalistic roots like up until then most of our films I think had been quite meta quite big picture and it was like no okay I'm going to pursue this as an investigation and the the first piece was really like okay let's look at his let's look at where this money's actually going let's look at what he's saying let's see if it matches up to reality and that was a real sort of sense of okay this is this is in my skill set. Like it's, it's something that I'm able to do. It's something I haven't been doing a lot since the beginning of Rebel Wisdom, but it's like, okay, I've got these skills of kind of information processing and following the threads and following the money to some degree. Um, and what, what it also showed up, particularly when he then ran for London mayor, using the money he'd scammed out of people for this digital freedom platform thing that never existed to run for mayor, was the, the, how bad the legacy media were. Like, they were doing puff pieces on this guy. Oh, this buff American guy is running for mayor. Could he possibly be mayor? It's like, um, you're basically enabling this guy. Like, realizing that the media, he's hacked the electoral process. He's joined in the mayoral campaign. He's hacked the electoral process for attention. The very least that you can do as a, as a journalist or as the media is to scrutinize the guy. And it's not hard. Like, there's a, there was a Vice article about the... the, the YouTuber who scammed his followers out of a million dollars, like a basic cutting search would bring up the fact that this guy's a wrong one. And they, they dropped the ball in such a major way. So it's like, okay, I wasn't necessarily even gonna pursue him again or, or cover him again on, on the channel during the London Mayor campaign, but it was like, if that's the quality of the kind of journalism that's gonna be done around this, then okay, I'm gonna step up and start kind of pursuing this guy. And so we did another series of films during the mayoral campaign as well. Um, and there was sort of a sense of, yeah, so, something similar I think has happened with The Dark Horse, um, this sort of sense of it's, I'm in a fairly unique position as someone with a, with a new a channel in the kind of heterodox space. And a lot of this stuff that's being reported just doesn't add up in any way. And I kind of feel a responsibility to say that. And the other really fascinating thing that I think Brian Rose exploited because there's a sort of almost religious fervor around free speech as a sacred value, especially online. Like I think it's probably one of the, the, the biggest um, and easiest triggers to kind of operate. And so that's why I think people need to be really suspicious when they hear people crying censorship or they hear people crying free speech. It's like, yeah, be careful. Those are really kind of powerful drivers and make sure you're not being kind of exploited. And also this sense of religious fervor particularly around the ivermectin story. Like the ivermectin, and I, I don't know if I've said this quite as, quite as clearly before, but ivermectin is clearly a cult. Like it may also work. It may be that we find out that it's, I don't think we'll ever find out it's as powerful as 100% effective as a prophylactic or any of the kind of ridiculous things that are being said about it for quite a while. Um, that's, I think, clearly not true. And the more evidence we have, the more evidence we, we know that that's, it's, it's certainly not 100% effective. Pierre Corey himself got COVID despite taking ivermectin and prophylactic, so that should prove that it's not 100% successful. Um, but it may be proved that ivermectin is a really effective drug against COVID. It doesn't stop the fact that it was a cult. It has definitely been a cult. Like the amount of passion, the amount of certainty, the amount of kind of like Brett Weinstein, taking ivermectin on air it's like how much more kool-aid can you get than that it's 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 astonishing like the the it it sort of is that kind of religious fervor that we've talked about quite a lot the kind of analogies for religion that are showing up everywhere yeah and you know andy warhol said in the future everyone will be famous for 15 minutes i think the new version of that for me is in the future everything will be a religion for 15 minutes a parasite drug, um, a, a free speech guru. You know, it's and and for me, it's 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 weird as hell. But it's not surprising because this, uh, you know, we talked about it before. This this whole of meaning and purpose and and kind of, um, at, you know, uh, confidence in what the world is and who we are. This kind of big void we have. It's it's a void. It's a vacuum for us to then project everything into. And I think. It's worth. It's also worth bringing in the frame of uh, of the sacred and of the profane. You know, I've been looking at this a lot recently, looking at the sociology of this. And Durkheim, sociologist, was I think the first one to say 
society always has the sacred and the profane, and it runs through absolutely everything. And then more recently, uh, Jeffrey Alexander, who's a, who's a really respected sociologist, he's made the, the same argument. He said, look, look at any institution. We have profane and we have sacred. The constitution is sacred, but um, OnlyFans is profane. You know, we see it everywhere. So we cannot escape this sense of something. And the sacred is what we set aside and has a, holds a different place in our hearts and our minds and in the way we treat it. And it's happening anyway. It's happening especially online. I think it's interesting that a lot of the, the sense making around this, the better sense making, is coming from the alternative media happening online rather than the mainstream because in a way it's a human phenomena, but it's also an internet phenomena. And I've, I argued this during the pandemic, I, call it, um, I wrote an essay called The Age of Breach because you know, I was looking at, for example, the, the right of the Capitol building and the GameStop phenomena and a few other things, wokeism as well. This, we, we, we're in this age where we're, and the pandemic enhanced this because we spent a lot more time online, I think, where we're, we're kind of in this meme, mimetic meaning-making process online. And we're creating our own like proto-religions and then they're breaching into the real world. So like the Capitol building, the Capitol storming is a great example because of the, the, no one's, they look, everyone looks so surprised that they're actually in there. You're, kind of, you're from the, the kind of collective unconscious of the internet into the real world. Um, and I think we're seeing it again with the ivermectin. Um, we're seeing it. We're seeing it happen over and over and over again. And this is something that I think you know. We talked before about um, uh, Jordan Peterson, the intellectual dark web, and the sacred. I think this is key to sense making right now. Is 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 having a space for understanding that so much of what we're seeing can't be uh, explained rationally. We can't have a rational. We can can and need to have a conversation about what are the facts. That has to happen. It can't be explained solely rationally. That's a better way to say it. Yeah, it can't be explained solely rationally. We have to have a conversation about propositional knowing, as John Vivek would call it. What, what can we say is true together? That's essential. We'll always need to have that. At the same time, and this is about the multiple perspectives, we have to recognize that we aren't just rational actors. You know, that whole idea in economics has been completely discredited. And, and the neuroscience doesn't support it either. We, we make decisions emotionally and then post-rationalize them. So we need to be able to bring that framing in. And it's very uncomfortable for, for a kind of modernist mindset. It's very uncomfortable for, say, like a new atheist mindset, even though it's such a dogmatically religious movement <laughs> itself. But I think that's something that I was, you know, I think we talk about a lot. I feel very strongly. I often feel like a little bit anxious about talking about it sometimes because I was like, oh, that's, it sounds a bit woo, but it's, you know, in, in my view, it's, it's not. It's an essential part of being a human being that we've lost. And unless we integrate it into everything else, we're going to just be perplexed by what's happening. And if we can bring in an understanding of the unconscious, understanding of the, our kind of religious tendencies as human beings, then things start to make a little bit more sense. We can navigate a bit better. We don't understand everything, but we can at least look at certain very strange things happening in culture and go, okay, there's a, we have a little bit of a roadmap to start making sense of this. Mm. Yeah, and we covered this sense of the weird erupting into the world quite a lot during uh, the pandemic. We had the series about the storming of the Capitol, which was the perfect example, like that, the QAnon shaman. QAnon shaman in the Capitol building was the prime image of the return of the irrational. Like it was kind of the herald of the return of the irrational. The kind of um, there's a beautiful line in one of the in one of the articles. I think that the, the, the QAnon shaman howling to heathen gods in the center of the the kind of the center of rationality in the Senate building was like the herald of this is this sort of thing is going to keep happening. Perhaps not in the same way, but that's why we had the really we had a really interesting interview with Eric Davis, who's kind of one of the premier sort of historians of the weird, historians of the weird, the psychedelic, the peculiar, the kind of mythological undercurrents of American society, and like those are the people we need to be listening to. I think now, like those those were the people who were pushing furthest into kind of the the unconscious and the kind of subliminal, and all of that stuff is now erupting because of the nature of decentralized media. Like all of th that kind of low resolution grand narrative that we talked about at the beginning that sustained us maybe from the end of the Second World War up until 10, 15 years ago is crumbling under the weight of the multiple perspectives of the alternative. And that genie will never be put back in the, the lamp, like it can't be. 
And it's like, that's the process we're in. And so the only way forward is integration. The only way forward is actually to wrestle with those kind of forces, some of which are forces we haven't had to wrestle with for a very long time. Like if, if you thought that fascism was gone, no, nope, fascism has come back. Communism has come back. Like all of these bad answers from earlier in, in the, that have been proved not to work, like for anyone with, with an iota of common sense would know that those are not salute, scalable solutions. Um, but we're gonna have to wrestle with them all over again. Like you can't put them back in the bottle. One of the regrets that I have is not doing something about QAnon earlier. Because I remember about a year before the Capitol riot, like we've been, I've been sort of tracking it for a while, about a year before the Capitol riot, I remember reading something about it and thinking, oh, this is the perfect new religion. For America in particular, because America has such a whole history of um, conspiracy thinking, like the paranoid mindset in America has been a big thing. And personally, I think, Little aside, I think the reason for that is that there was a lot of shady shit that went on during the 60s in particular, like the hidden war against the counterculture that we now know of through MK Ultra and Mockingbird and all of that stuff. I don't think America can move on from its history until it has something like a kind of truth and reconciliation committee where powerful forces admit what they were up to, like what really happened with the, with the death of JFK, RFK, Martin Luther King, um, some of the stuff we know about, some of the stuff we don't yet know about, um, but until they until they wrestle with that, I think they're they're going to be hamstrung by conspiracy theories because they fit with like when there are secrets in any system, they will kind of manifest in weird and wacky ways. So something like QAnon, which is an all-encompassing conspiracy theory about cabal of pedophiles, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, is there's a difference between a conspiracy theory and an all-encompassing conspiracy theory. Because then it, you're, in, you're in a world of religion again. You're in a world of like angels and demons and Satan and literally, which is why QAnon was so sort of sticky, because who wouldn't want to be involved in a fight for your kind of, a fight against a cabal of evil paedophiles that you're on the verge of winning, we're about to uncover them, the great awakening is at hand. Like, of course, it's the most powerful story in the world. Like, it's an incredible powerful story. It, I think it can only, when I was reading it, I was like, oh my God, this is incredibly powerful. It's brilliantly designed in a way, like it's an alternate reality game where you figure it out yourself, but you're actually manipulated towards particular answers. And if you think about it, it's like, who, and I was seeing it like a bit of a mind virus. Okay, the QAnon is like a mind virus. So who would be um, the potential recipients for that? Well, it's pretty much anyone who's never had any like up close and personal interactions with media or government. And so they kind of see like the whole kind of authorities, media, government as a kind of blob. It's a them, it's over there, it's a them. And then you can kind of imagine that there could be a level of coordination between media and government that isn't possible. Like that's where any conspiracy theory kind of just jumps the shark. It's like, okay, a, a small conspiracy where, like for example, Lockerbie, where we probably pretty much know it wasn't the, Lib the Libyans, it was the Iranians, even the Lockerbie families thought it was. That's a, that's a doable, um, like Oklahoma bombing. We kind of know that the FBI had infiltrated the, the group that, that ended up carrying it out. And probably there was some kind of screw up where they didn't, stop it happening and they could have stopped it happening like those and then covered it up like those there are many conspiracies that have been validated by research by genuine journalism something like QAnon is like that's something different it's not a conspiracy theory it's a kind of all-encompassing conspiracy theory but then I was thinking okay so who's who's the potential kind of recipient for this and it's like how many people in the world see authorities journey journalists or journalism and media and uh, governments as this kind of just them, it's like, that's like 60, 70% of people. So that's how powerful this can be. That's how powerful, like that, that anyone who has not had, maybe only 20% like of people have ever seen like media and, and government up close and realize like how many competing interests there are, how many different incentive structures there are, how much, how little coordination there is, how fucking dysfunctional they all are. And so the idea of them being able to pull off something that would require the, a level of coordination like that we'd never seen before with no one finding out and no one 
no one find yeah no, no journalist ever sort of sniffing it out like you're you're into the realms of of real unlikeliness when you're talking about something like QAnon um, but yeah I, I regret not featuring it earlier because it, as soon as I spotted it I was like oh my god this is this is incredibly powerful and it's going to be a huge influence so talking about the world getting weirder and mentioning Eric Davis in particular we've also been looking re really over the kind of the, like the last six months at the reintroduction of psychedelics into the mainstream, which has been, um, you know, something I've been involved with for a long time, but has really, really actually kicked off in a bigger way during COVID with psychedelic pharma companies floating on the stock market kind of for the first time in this, this kind of real shift of mainstream acceptance. And I think it's been, a, it's been a really interesting process of looking at a lot of the, the dynamics we've covered before, but playing out in real life. So what happens when something potentially transformative, so transformative on an existing institution, which should be the medical, you know, mental health institution, and psychedelics also have the, the potential to really transform our cognition, transform the way we conceive ourselves, tra transform our sense of meaning and connection. You know, so it goes right back to, to the meaning crisis. So this is incredible potential hitting up against market forces. And what happens when, so, you know, we've looked at what happens when truth comes up against market forces, what happens to the information landscape, pretty much anything that comes up against the market and the incentives of the market um, gets kind of uh, twisted and, um, and turned around until it becomes another aspect of, of a system which is actually leading us further and further from truth. So what I found really interesting about the, the kind of psychedelic capitalism, psychedelic mainstreaming is a question of how might it be done differently? You know, from all these interesting uh, thinkers we speak to, everyone who is kind of geared in and tapped into complexity and game theory, is there a way to actually this time allow something to come into the culture and, and transform it? So that's been, um, you know, an ongoing process of inquiry we've been on too. And your reference to game theory reminds me of another big theme we've covered on the channel that we didn't mention, which is game B. The idea of um, if, if the trap that we're in, it, it's not an ideology, it's the game theoretic constraints of our existing structure that we didn't have when we were in tribes because they were largely self-policing. You'd be able to spot kind of the sociopaths or the narcissists and people would kind of police that through gossip or through other kind of systems, as soon as you go beyond a certain level, you actually create lo lots of these niches for people to exploit. And there are then incentive structures, there's the, the race to the bottom, there's the tragedy of the commons, where basically, if you don't see the sucker, then it's you. And effectively, you, someone is gonna be a dick, so it might as well be you. All of these kind of dynamics that start, cut, start to come in, and the question of a game B world is like, how do you start closing some of those loops? How do you start kind of creating an environment where there are consequences, there is accountability, uh, but there's also kind of positive feedback loops for good actors to kind of work together and to kind of support each other. And then what would it mean for a game A enterprise or a game B enterprise to win the game A game? Like that's the, the kind of final, um, yeah, that, that, and we did, did a couple of films, or quite a few films around Game B, including the history of Game B with um, Brett Weinstein and Jim Rutt. So we're kind of up to date, and up to date is the new sense-making series that this is the launch film for. And we've mentioned a few of the other films that are coming up as part of it. And one of those is an interview that I did with Chris Williamson of the Modern Wisdom podcast. Really interesting guy, he's got a completely different backstory. Um, no sort of um, journalistic background. He, he was a contestant on Love Island, um, kind of reality TV show, uh, originally a club promoter from Newcastle, so completely different background. But what I've really enjoyed is speaking to him and him, he's very, very curious. He's very curious, he's a really intelligent guy, really wants to get better at what he's doing, really has a strong ethical sense of what he's doing with his podcast and is asking me lots of questions about kind of like, why do you make this decision? Or how do you come to this ethical perspective? And like, it's been a really interesting process of kind of thinking through my kind of attitude to things that I took from um, my work with the BBC or Channel 4 and why I make the ethical decisions that I make. Um, and we have, what I really liked about this conversation is it kind of moves on 
I think the conversation at the moment is still so focused around this kind of censorship free speech binary that is completely outdated. Like, it's not, that's not a grown up conversation. A grown up conversation is what are our rights and responsibilities? This entire conversation that we've have had and the reflections that I've had on it since, it just sort of opens up for every time that you glimpse the corner of an answer, four more questions arise. And there isn't a simple solution to this. To be honest, I think you know, it is beyond me to come up with some sort of a solution, but it's not beyond me to have conversations that can hopefully try and elucidate whether a solution is possible and so on and so forth. Uh, and that, I think, is the role that a lot of creators can take. You know, I don't understand the way that the mainstream media works the way that you do. I don't understand Ofcom and, and stuff like that. But that doesn't mean that the conversation can't be fruitful. That doesn't mean that people can't contribute. And this is what I think we've finished. It's been a little while since we had our first conversation, so I apologize if I'm repeating myself. But this is what I suggested that the audience try to inject themselves into also. Like, look, like if you want to... If you want to improve the media landscape, if you care as much as the vitriolic comments suggest, then be a contributor, you know, like actually contribute to the conversation, stress test people's ideas in a good faith way. Um, yeah, that's some thoughts. And so following this sort of thread of sense making, we have an interview coming up in a couple of weeks time with Dave Snowden who created the Kinefin framework to kind of look at how, how you make sense in different environments, complex environments versus complicated environments. And you could kind of call him the OG of sense making. Yeah, and then also coming up, we have a lot of really interesting psychedelic content. We have Dennis McKenna um, coming up pretty soon. I'm also working on a, a, a film kind of following up the rise of psychedelic capitalism, looking at how, how that space is all playing out and then taking in some different frames to help try and make sense of it. <clears throat> so that, but again, we also have some, and we also have some good psychedelic content coming up. We have a film with Dennis McKenna, who was in our digital campfire recently. Uh, also a film speaking to some of the major players in the psychedelic renaissance, trying to kind of follow on the rise of psychedelic capitalism and see what's been going on since then. And then at the end of September, actually specifically the 25th and 26th of September, we have our next big free online event. So if anyone was at the Rebel Wisdom Festival, which was uh, about a year ago, a little bit longer than that, last May, it's going to be um, similar kind of uh, format, but this is really about, it's called the state of sense making. So it's really about the state of sense making. We're hoping to get some, some big names, but a little bit like we were saying before, it's not just a broadcast, it's a participatory experience. Um, it's about us getting some really good framing from, from brilliant minds, but then also trying to practice making sense together. And it's also just a really nice opportunity to meet other people who are interested in this entire space. So you can register for that event below. We'll uh, then update everyone on, on speakers as and when they come in and, um, and how to join, of course, before the 25th of September. Yeah, and if you've watched this far, then you must be a Rebel Wisdom super fan. And we're looking for I guess Rebel Wisdom super fans who have skills in different areas who might want to help out, might want to join some of the projects that we're doing. So in particular, we're looking for people who've got skills in storytelling, video editing, graphic design, motion graphics, all of that sort of stuff. And we're also looking for an office manager, ideally based in London. And most of those, I think, especially the video editing based in London would be a huge advantage because uh, obviously they're really big files. The, the graphic design and stuff is, is less important. But we're looking for people who can help us represent some of these ideas. Like how do you represent sense making in a kind of in a in a visual visual way? How do you represent awareness? How do you represent all of these different kind of complex ideas and how can we start to produce more films around this? Um, because we're as we said, we're a very small operation, so we're looking to expand, we're looking to do more of the kind of films that we've already done. And hope you enjoy the new series and see you soon. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101 with Daniel Schmachtenberger, 
Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>